You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is July 12, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, pulmonary function tests. Our presenter is Dr. Gary Salzman. He's the director of the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, good morning, everybody. It is July 12th. We're on our second round of conferences online in allergy today here. We're privileged to have Dr. Gary Salzman, who is a pulmonologist working at Truman Medical Center in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, he has been helping our allergy fellowship program for greater than 20 years that I know of um, through, through um, asthma clinics. Um, and he's going to be t- speaking on pulmonary function testing. Um, as you'll know or will learn, pulmonary function testing is a valuable tool that allows further insight into the patient's respiratory system. With that, Dr. Salzman, welcome, and thanks for being here. Great. Thanks for the introduction. So we're going to talk a little bit about pulmonary function tests. And so by the end of this, you should be uh, familiar with the physiological uh, basics of the PFTs. You can distinguish between obstructive and restrictive, and you'll be familiar with the, the indication. So you should be able to, to get this, and then when you're working with me in clinic, there'll be plenty of practice in, in reading PFTs. So uh, the first thing we need to talk about is what we're testing for, what are we looking for. We're looking for, obviously, a mechanical function of the lung, the volumes, uh, the flows, uh, airway hyperreactivity. We also want to look at gas exchange. Uh, we can do that through diffusing capacity. Uh, we can also draw a blood gas if we wanted to do that. We don't routinely do that with a, a PFT, but we do uh, do diffusing capacity when we do full PFTs. Um, what are the indications? We want to evaluate a pulmonary symptom or sign, cough, shortness of breath, a wheezing. Those would be some of the, the common symptoms. It's interesting, for insurance purposes, you have to have a symptom. And so if you order PFT because the patient is a smoker or because the patient has asthma, uh, they won't pay for it. You have to have some symptom, a cough, shortness of breath, wheezing, uh, something, uh, in order to um, get an appropriate indication so that insurance will pay for the study. So we can evaluate whether they're restrictive, uh, obstructive, or it's mixed. We can also quantify it. Uh, quantify the severity of impairment uh, and evaluation of response to therapy. Uh, We can do this uh, for people undergoing um, uh, pre-op evaluation uh, for surgery to see um, how um, uh, they would tolerate a surgery in terms of their lung function. And then sometimes people applying for disability uh, need to do PFTs to see uh, whether they qualify for disability. Um, So just a definition of a couple things. So Residual volume, that's the volume of air in the lungs after maximal expiration. Now, we can't measure this on spirometry. We have to do lung volumes. Uh, So this is not something that we would measure on routine uh, PFTs or spirometry in the office. This would need a little bit more um, complicated uh, measurement of lung volumes, which we usually do with uh, a body box. Expiratory reserve volume is the maximum volume of air expired from the resting and expiratory level. Now, we can measure this um, with spirometry, and this is actually a very really important number. A lot of people overlook this. Uh, the ERV is, is um, very reflective of restriction related to obesity. And so in obese patients, they're going to have a, a marked reduction in expiratory reserve volume. They can't continue to exhale out after their um, resting uh, uh, in expiratory level, because if they have, uh, you know, a, a large uh, abdominal, um, uh, their belly is big, um, that will prevent them from uh, maximally uh, exhaling. So ERV, you know, does give us some uh, idea about restriction related to uh, obesity. Uh, pregnancy will also decrease the ERV. Uh, tidal volume as a volume of air inspired or expired with each breath during quiet breathing. So we're all uh, breathing in and out tidal volume right now. So tidal volume is our normal resting uh, breathing. 
Inspiratory reserve volume, the maximum volume of air inspired from resting in the expiratory level. So when you take a really deep breath in, all the way in, uh, that's uh, IRV. And then inspiratory capacity, maximum amount of volume inspired from an expiratory level. And then vital capacity, uh, this is what we do when we do spirometry. We do a forced vital capacity. We have the patient um, blow as hard and fast as they can. So the maximum volume of air expired from the maximum inspiratory level is measured. So uh, when it's a forced maneuver, we call it the FVC or forced vital capacity. And that's the maneuver we want people to do um, when we're doing spirometry, the FVC. Uh, inspiratory uh, vital capacity is uh, just the reverse, the maximum volume of air inspired from maximum expiratory uh, level. This could be reduced if you have uh, some upper airway disease, uh, uh, vocal cord paralysis, vocal cord dysfunction, or vocal cord tumor can impair your inspiratory vital capacity. Uh, FRC, or functional residual capacity, volume of air remaining in the lungs at the end expiratory level. So that's residual volume plus expiratory reserve volume. And again, we can't measure this on routine spirometry. We would need lung volumes. And total lung capacity is a total volume of air in the lungs after maximal inspiration, the volume of all of the compartments. And again, this we cannot measure with spirometry. We would need uh, lung volumes. So this is kind of just kind of a, um, a graphic description of all this. So all the air in the lung is total lung capacity. That's all these things added up is the total lung capacity, or, or TLC. And this tells us uh, the entire uh, volume in the, in the lung. And, of course, we need uh, lung volumes for this. We can't get the spirometry. Tidal volume is just the normal in and out breathing that we're doing right now. And then inspiratory reserve volume, we take a really deep breath all the way in as high as we can. And that's inspiratory reserve volume. And then as we blow all that air out, as far as we can blow it out, keep blowing, keep blowing until we get to RV, then that uh, is, um, is forced vital capacity. Um, and then uh, expiratory reserve volume is what we can breathe out uh, at the end of a normal tidal breath. So this is ERV. Um, and then uh, inspiratory capacity is uh, breathing in here. Um, so these are, uh, and then functional residual capacity, residual volume are here. Um, and these, of course, would need um, uh, further testing beyond spirometry. But spirometry, we generally can get force vital capacity. We can get extra reserve volume, inspiratory capacity. So we can get all of these numbers above residual volume. We can't get residual volume on spirometry. So... The basic measurements, the most important, is the FEV1, the forced expiratory volume in one second. So that's uh, the volume uh, of air expired in one second during a forced exhalation, starting at full inspiration. So that's the FEV1. That represents large airway function, and it would be reduced in asthma, it would be reduced in COPD, uh, in airway disease, FEV1 is reduced. Force vital capacity, of course, is the entire amount of air ex exhaled over a, a forced exhalation uh, from breathing in as, as uh, deep as you can and then rapidly forcing exhalation out. And that's uh, force vital capacity. So these are two very important numbers uh, that we want to look at. Uh, another number that's important is a, is a mid-expiratory flow rate. It's called the FEF 2575. The forced expiratory flow between 25 and 75 percent of uh, vital capacity, and uh, the mean rate of expiratory flow. Uh, and so this tells us more about small airways, FEF 2575. Sometimes in asthma, the FEV1 will be normal, but we'll, uh, in more early or mild disease, we may see some reductions in 2575. This is effort dependent, though. So uh, it may, if the patient's not giving a good effort, we may have um, some um, false positives in terms of reduction in 2575. But if they give it a good effort, this could suggest small airway disease. And cigarette smokers, FEF 2575 becomes abnormal first before FEV1. So in early COPD, uh, we see reductions in the FEF 2575. Uh, the FEV1 FEC ratio is very important. It's just a ratio. It's just the absolute FEV1 divided by the absolute FEC, and it's uh, given as a ratio. On the flow volume loop, we'll look at that in a volume time graph. So that's some of the things that we get on spirometry, which we do routinely in the office. So 
when you're reading PFTs, you, you have to go through a, um, you know, a, a pattern of, of how you're going to do it at the same time, same way every time. So the first, te the first uh, question is very important. Is the test uh, interpretable? Is it an adequate test? If it's not, then the data obviously is, is not um, adequate. And so you've heard garbage in, garbage out. If you have a poor test and it's not interpretable, you can't really make any conclusions from it. So that's the first thing that you want to answer. Are the tests normal? So is it normal or abnormal? That's the first question. And then if it's abnormal, what's the pattern and severity of the abnormality? Is it obstructive? Is it restrictive? Is it mixed? Is it mild? Is it moderate? Is it severe? And so those are the next questions. And then what does it mean for the patient uh, in terms of therapy, uh, what therapy you're going to give the patient, or do they qualify for disability, or are they going to be able to tolerate this uh, gallbladder surgery? So these are some of the questions that we want to ask when we're um, starting to read PFTs. So it's important to know what is an acceptable uh, spirometry um, test. So you want to have a smooth, continuous curve. You want to have a good early effort, a rapid upstroke to a slightly rounded, sharp peak. Time to peak flow should be less than 120 milliseconds. Uh, we want an upward concavity at the, at the end of exhalation on the, force, uh, on the flow volume loop. Uh, we want a plateau of the volume change over time on the volume uh, time curve. And we generally want at least six seconds of expiratory time. So, so this is the, uh, the flow volume loop. Uh, and um, what we want to see, again, is a rapid upstroke. Uh, and then the peak up here, we have a kind of a rounded peak. Now, this is the peak expiratory flow, uh, but this is in liters per second. So this is about nine liters. And so uh, you might think, well, that, that doesn't sound like the peak flows that we get from the handheld devices. The handheld devices uh, measure liters per minute. Uh, on PFTs, we measure it as liters per second. And so if you want to compare, uh, a flow rate of uh, 9 liters per second, you'd have to multiply times 60, and that would be uh, a handheld peak flow meter would be about 540 uh, liters per minute for one of the handheld um, peak flow meters that we send home with patients. So you can kind of um, calculate based on um, the uh, flow volume curve uh, what the peak flow is, and then kind of can compare that with the patient's uh, home peak flow readings. So yeah, you have to multiply this number by 60 to get the handheld um, peak flow meter reading, which was liters per minute. This is liters per second. So nine liters per second would be equivalent to 540 liters per minute. And then the volume type curve is also important. Again, we want to wrap it up stroke, and we want it to plateau, and we want to see at least six seconds of exhalation. And we also want this to be flat at the end. Sometimes in patients with COPD, they may need even more than six seconds to completely empty their lung. This, this line will continue to go up. And until it flattens out, then you're not going to have an adequate test. But even in this test, even if they went five seconds, that would probably be okay because the, the volume curve is flattened out. We're not getting any more volume even after five seconds. So it's important that it's flat. Uh, but ideally, we'd like to see it at least six seconds, particularly if it's still going up, if we're still going up and then they stop at say four seconds and this the value is still going up, then it's not an adequate uh, test. So are the results normal? So how do we even determine normal? So uh, normal results are assigned by 95% confidence interval, the range of values in which 95% of healthy people will fall. And so how do we know uh, what healthy people to compare um, patients with? So the most important thing actually is height. Uh, the taller you are, uh, the larger your lung volumes are going to be and flow rates. The shorter you are, the, the less they're going to be. So height is probably the most important thing. Um, in our PFT lab, we used to ask people how tall they were, but obviously that's not a very good way to do it. And since the normals are going to depend on it, it really is important to measure them, to actually see how, how tall they are. Uh, that will give you more accurate results in terms of your, your normal. So it's, it's recommended that you actually measure height so you can, because um, all your normals are going to be based on height. Uh, age, sex, racial and ethnic background are also taken into consideration. We have tables uh, for different racial and ethnic backgrounds. We don't have them for everybody, but some of the common ones. Uh, but that plays a role too. But I would say the most important thing is height. And so if you're off on the height, 
then uh, you can have some um, inaccurate results because the normals are based on uh, a lot on height, and that's probably the most important uh, factor here. Okay, so how do we go about, you know, approaching this from the start? Now, you'll look at PFTs, and there's a bunch of numbers. Some of the numbers we don't even really look at. They're kind of just um, there. But uh, the important number, the most important number here would be the FEV1, FVC ratio. <clears throat> and um, that's the ratio of FEV1 to FVC. And so we want that to be <clears throat> greater than 95% of predicted. And there's, the computer will actually give you a prediction for that patient's age of what their FEV1, FVC ratio is. Now, some people, um, you know, um, focus on 70% as the cutoff for FEV1, FVC ratio, and that is from the gold guidelines, the global obstruction of lung disease guidelines, where for COPD, they made the cutoff at 70%, less than 70% was uh, obstruction, and then greater than 70% was not obstruction. But that was in COPD patients. And so most COPD patients are in their 50s, 60s, and 70% probably is a reasonable ratio for that age group. But if you're talking about um, young people in their 20s, they're going to have a much higher FEV1, FVC normal. It may be 80 or 85% may be normal for a 20-year-old. Whereas if you have an 80-year-old, uh, the normal FEV1, FVC ratio may be 60 or 65%. So the computer will actually tell you what the ratio should be. So I would not recommend using 70 for every patient because... Um, different age groups are going to give you different normal ratios. And so I would look at what uh, the percent predicted is. If it's less than 95% predicted of the ratio, then that would uh, indicate some degree of, uh, of obstruction. But using 70% for everybody probably is, is not reasonable. Um, young people are going to have higher uh, ratios. Older people are going to have lower ratios. And so use the, uh, if it's a, uh, uh, less than 95% predicted, then that would indicate obstructive. Um, if it uh, is not, uh, and the FEV1 FVC ratio is above 95% predicted, then um, you would need to look at the force vital capacity. Uh, if the force vital capacity is reduced, uh, but the ratio is normal, then we look at it's being restricted. If uh, the force vital capacity is not reduced, uh, and it's normal, and the FEV1 FVC ratio is normal, and the FEV1 is normal, then we have a normal uh, PFT. So severity of obstruction is based on FEV1. Uh, so mild, 65 to 80 percent, a moderate, 65, 50 to 65, severe, 35 to 50, and very severe, 34 percent or less. So severity of obstruction, once you have a low FEV1, FEC ratio, you look at severity and you go by the FEV1 to give you a severity uh, level. Uh, bronchodilator response, this is uh, important. When we do spirometry, we like to do it pre and post, pre-bronchodilator and post-bronchodilator. So we bring the patient in, we do spirometry, we get the values. Uh, we generally give them four puffs of albuterol. Uh, and then we repeat uh, the spirometry. Uh, and what we look for is uh, increases in FEV1 or FEC that are greater than 12% and 200 milliliters. The reason we put the 200 milliliters in there is if you start off with a really low FEV1, it doesn't really take much to, to get to 12%. So if you think about it, you know, if you start with a 500C FEV1, it's not going to take very much to get to 12%, and that may not be significant. So in order for it to be significant, it has to be both. It has to improve by 12% and it has to improve by 200 cc's. That uh, eliminates those patients with very severe obstruction uh, who probably don't have reversibility, who may meet the 12%, but they won't meet the 200 cc's. Because yeah. if you have a 500 cc, um, you know, uh, FEV1, um, 200 cc's, you're going to need a 40% improvement. So restrictive abnormalities are based on total lung capacity. Uh, so 65 to 80 is mild, 50 to 65 is moderate, and less than 50% would be severe. So that's kind of your, um, your severity there. Okay. So if you don't have a total lung capacity, which you're not going to have on spirometry, you can look at FVC, 
uh, and, and uh, do severity based on that. So we have different flow volume loops um, and patterns. So we have kind of the normal loop, the solid line, which would be a, a normal loop. Uh, this line here would indicate obstruction, where you have kind of this um, uh, obstructive pattern. And then this pattern, it looks just like the normal, except it's lower. It's a lower volume. This would indicate restriction. And then when you're looking uh, here, um, this is obstruction. Uh, this is normal, the solid one. And then this is restriction, where you have a much a lower lung volumes. So we also want to look at... Um, uh, upper airway obstructive patterns, and we want to uh, differentiate fixed upper airway obstruction, variable extrathoracic um, upper airway obstructive patterns, and variable interthoracic uh, uh, upper uh, obstructive patterns. So uh, when both inspiratory and expiratory limbs are flattened, like in this case, so this is the inspiratory limb on the bottom, this is the expiratory limb on top, when both of those are flattened, uh, that's a fixed uh, airway obstruction. So if you have um, a big tumor in your vocal cord uh, that's basically partially blocking your upper airway, that would be a fixed defect, or a, a big tumor in the upper trachea uh, below the vocal cords that's fixed, that would uh, cause this fixed obstruction. If you have bilateral vocal cord paralysis, both the vocal cords are paralyzed, you can get this fixed uh, obstruction pattern. Uh, so this is a fixed um, uh, a pattern. Uh, variable extrathoracic obstruction, you're going to have a normal expiratory limb. So everything in exhalation is normal, but inspiratory is flattened. So this uh, indicates the upper airway. Uh, so uh, would be in the upper airway around the vocal cord. So if you have like a single vocal cord paralysis, I could give you this. If you have um, vocal cord dysfunction, where the vocal cords paradoxically move together during inspiration instead of move out to get this flattened loop. This would be associated with patients having strider, with inspiratory strider, where they have this inspiratory flattening. And so in exhalation, they're pulling this uh, uh, open, but then in inhalation, they're sucking this closed, and that's why you're, they're having uh, variable uh, extrathoracic uh, upper uh, airway obstruction. And then variable interthoracic is fairly uncommon. That would be kind of a ball valve type obstruction in the trachea, uh, say a benign tumor, a flopping tumor, or a foreign body in the upper trachea. You would have a normal inspiratory loop, normal inspiratory loop, but then flatten uh, expiratory loop. Uh, and so this would uh, indicate a variable interthoracic um, obstruction. This worsens during exhalation. So lung volumes is another uh, test that you can uh, do. This is over and beyond uh, spirometry, and we do that um, in the pulmonary function lab. Where spirometry, we can do it anywhere. We can do it in the clinic. Um, um, but lung volumes, it takes a little bit more equipment. So we can't get residual volume with spirometry. Um, amongst the residual capacity, we can measure, uh, and uh, residual volume is obtained from, from that. There's two different ways that we can measure functional residual capacity, uh, helium dilution and body plasmography. Body plasmography is much better. It will actually measure the entire uh, lung volume, even though that parts of the lung, like in, say, emphysema, are not very well ventilated. So if you have emphysematous blebs with airflow obstruction and some of those blebs aren't very well uh, communicated to the main airways, body plasmography will still give you accurate um, measurement of, of that lung volume. Helium dilution is only going to be able to measure uh, areas of the lung that helium can get to. And so if you have um, bad emphysema and a lot of small airway disease and some of the lungs that are not uh, very well ventilated, helium dilution may underestimate your, your lung volume. So it's not as good as body plasmography. Also, if you have like a perforated tympanic membrane, helium dilution won't give you any kind of accurate results because the helium is going to leak out through their ear. So lung volumes, you don't have to know this formula, uh, the helium dilution method, uh, and you don't have to know the body plasmography uh, formula either. Uh, this is basically how we do um, body plasmography. We sit the patient in a box, we seal them up, we close the box, uh, and then we measure different parameters. Um, we can measure the pressure in the box, 
Uh, we can measure the volume in the box. Uh, and then we can measure the pressure um, in the lungs uh, by the shutter valve, and then we can calculate the volume in the lungs, and that's how we do that. Uh, we know uh, volume and pressure in the box. We can measure that. We measure pressure at the patient's uh, mouth to reflect pressure in their lung, and then we can calculate the total um, of volume in their lung. And so that's body plasmography. Some people can't do this. They get claustrophobic. Uh, some people are too obese to fit in the box, and we have to do helium. Uh, but uh, if they're not obese and they don't have um, claustrophobia, um, then uh, we put them in the body box. Okay, so the other thing that we measure is diffusion capacity. So diffusion capacity we measure with a very, very small amount of carbon monoxide. You might think, oh my God, you poison people with carbon monoxide to do their breathing tests. It's a very, very small amount. And uh, because carbon monoxide uh, bounds so well to hemoglobin, it can really give us an idea of how well uh, gas transport goes through the alveolar membrane into the, um, into the blood. And so diffusion capacity gives us an idea of, of how oxygen is diffusing across the alveolar capillary membrane. So it's important in interstitial lung diseases to measure diffusion capacity to kind of get a, a, an idea of the severity of the diffusion capacity. In emphysema, where you have lung destruction, you're going to have marked reductions in diffusion. Whereas in asthma, where there's really no uh, destruction, it's all airway disease, diffusion capacity will actually be normal in asthma. It will be quite abnormal in emphysema. Uh, so it's really looking at the uh, alveolar capillary membrane. Uh, this is kind of the formula. And so factors that uh, affect diffusion capacity, if you've got a low lung volume, so someone, uh, let's say they had trauma and they lost their left lung, they only have their right lung, that will decrease their diffusion capacity by about 50%. But we also then do a second test where we um, uh, accommodate for volume. And so we have uncorrected diffusion. And so in that patient with only one lung, that would be low. But then we correct for their volume, and so uh, if that lung is normal, then uh, the corrected uh, diffusion would be actually normal. Um, so low lung volumes can be corrected out by the corrected uh, diffusion capacity. Same way if you're morbidly obese and you have very low lung volumes, but the lung that you have is functioning normally, the uncorrected diffusion capacity will be low, but the corrected one for lung volume will actually be normal. So low lung volumes will cause a decrease in uncorrected diffusion. But when you correct for uh, lung volume, uh, then uh, this should correct to normal. Uh, anemia will decrease diffusion. That has nothing to do with the lungs. And when you read the PFT results, it will always do a disclaimer. We, we, got, we don't measure their hemoglobin, which we don't routinely do. Uh, the decreased diffusion could be from anemia, and we generally put that in the report. They recently smoked. It can decrease their uh, diffusion. And COPD with emphysema can decrease their diffusion. There's some things that elevate diffusion capacity. If you have polycythemia, if you have too much blood, it can actually increase it above normal. Alveolar hemorrhage, if you have blood in the alveolar spaces, then the uh, carbon monoxide is taken up really easily because it doesn't have to go through the membrane. The blood is sitting right there in the, in the lung in elevated altitude. So abnormal diffusion capacity, um, interstitial lung disease, sarcoidosis, pulmonary fibrosis, uh, diseases that affect the pulmonary capillaries, pulmonary embolism, uh, producing increased diffusion distance, a pneumocystis, and then alveolar destruction, emphysema. And um, um, in emphysema, you're going to have alveolar destruction. So the differentiation, you know, from asthma and emphysema is asthma would generally have a normal diffusion capacity, whereas emphysema with COPD would generally have a low diffusion capacity. So uh, other things that can increase diffusion capacity, mild congestive heart failure, asthma, exercise, uh, left to right shunt, all these things um, can um, increase your um, diffusion capacity. So what about bronchoprovocation? So there are certainly a lot of patients who come in that may have asthma, but when they come into the PFT lab or your office, their spirometry is normal because the asthma is an intermittent disease. And with asthma, if you're not exposed to triggers or allergens uh, or irritants, uh, 
then you could just uh, have a normal uh, spirometry when you're in uh, the office. So we oftentimes do bronchial provocation to go one step further to try to see um, if a patient actually has asthma or they don't have asthma, and we use bronchial provocation for that. So uh, generally, uh, if they do have this 12% and 200 cc increase, then you don't have to do bronchial provocation because you can demonstrate that they have uh, reversibility um, just by administration of bronchodilators. Um, the whole reversibility issue, um, I think, is a little misunderstood. Some people think, well, all patients with COPD have no reversibility, and all patients with asthma will have reversibility. Unfortunately, that's not true. Uh, it'd be nice if it was. Probably about 20% of asthma patients won't demonstrate um, reversibility with bronchodilators, and about 20% of COPD patients will demonstrate reversibility, but they don't have asthma. So there is some overlap in terms of reversibility. But bronchoprovocation is, is normally done in patients who have normal spirometry. They come in, uh, they're having some signs and symptoms that may be suggestive of asthma, uh, but their, their spirometry is completely normal. But we really want to know um, if they have asthma or not. We also do this uh, when we're doing research studies uh, for asthma drugs that we want to actually uh, see whether um, the amount of uh, reactivity to go decreases with the new investigational drug. So um, bronchial provocation can be performed with methacholine, with mannitol, with histamine, with exercise, cold air, uh, allergen, uh, that could be a very dangerous thing. Uh, it's only done in select uh, research uh, programs. There was a case at Johns Hopkins of an allergen bronchial provocation test that ended up with a patient death. Um, so allergens uh, are not routinely used for bronchial provocation. What is routinely used is methacholine. Uh, we used to have mannitol, and we used that for a while, and then uh, they took that off the market. Uh, some places use exercise, so looking for exercise-induced asthma uh, and bronchial provocation. But I would say most commonly, and what we use in our lab now, is, is all methacholine. Um, and what we do is we start with a very, very low concentration of methacholine, 0 0.05 milligrams per milliliter, because we do have a patient with asthma that has very reactive airways. We don't want to start with, obviously, a higher dose, because we could uh, precipitate a rather major asthma attack. So we start very, very low, and then we gradually go up, and then the top dose is 16 milligrams per milliliter. And the idea here is if you give 16 milligrams of methacholine and they don't have a drop in their FEV1 or FEC, they probably don't have asthma. So it's a pretty good test to rule out uh, asthma if they um, have prepared for the study appropriately. So just like allergy testing, they can't take uh, certain medicines right before they come in for the PFT. So you don't want people on antihistamines and then come in and do uh, skin testing for allergens. Same way with the bronchial provocation. We don't want someone uh, to use their albuterol inhaler 10 minutes before they come in for the bronchial provocation test, or they, we don't want them to use uh, their inhaled corticosteroid uh, within two weeks or their systemic steroid uh, within a week or so, because that will um, give you a false uh, negative. So we want them to withhold uh, those medications. So we measure FEV1 uh, and... Uh, it's a positive test if the FEV1 or FEC reduces by 20% after the administration of, of methacholine. Um, it's a very sensitive test if done appropriately. If the patients are withholding their, uh, their inhalers uh, appropriately, you're going to have very few false negatives, only when the medications are not emitted, and, and that obviously happens more often than not. If you have an albuterol inhaler and they take it that morning before their methacholine challenge, that would obviously give you a, a false negative. A specificity is really not that great. So a specificity is only about 50% for PC20 of 8. So that means that um, with a 20% decrease in FEV1 at 8 milligrams per milliliter or less, you're only going to get about a 50% sensitivity because we can get false positives. Allergic rhinitis, cystic fibrosis, heart failure, COPD, smoking, viral infections all can give you a false positive methacholine challenge. In fact, 1 to 7 percent of the population have reactive airway disease and up to 26 percent of smokers. So for the most part, I don't use a methacholine challenge to diagnose asthma. I use a methacholine challenge to rule out asthma when I think something else is going on.
Um, for research studies, you know, we look at the PC20 and we look at changes in PC20 based on in, in experimental medications. But there are quite a few reasons for false positives. And then the most common reason for a false negative is if the patients are um, continuing to take their asthma medicine right before their um, test, that could make you a, a false negative. So now let's go over some questions here. So we got a patient, FEV1 is 60% predicted. The FVC is 80% predicted. FEV1 ratio is 60% predicted. So we know that the ratio is low, so we know that's obstruction, right? And so the FEV1 is reduced to 60%, so that would be um, a moderate obstruction, right? FEV1 is down, FEV1 is reduced at 60%, so that would be moderate obstruction. Uh, here the FEV1 is 45% predicted, FEC is 45. So the ratio is completely normal. Uh, ratio is 100% is normal. Total lung capacity is reduced to 45% of predicted, so we know that this is severe restriction. Total lung capacity is less than 50%. Uh, ratio is normal, and so both FEV1 and both FEC are both reduced to the same degree, so this would indicate uh, restriction. And then the total lung capacity tells us the severity of the restriction. So restriction has a normal ratio, whereas obstruction has a low ratio. Expiratory time of 30 seconds during force valve capacity maneuver with spirometry indicates, of course, letter E, inadequate effort. Right? We want to at least look at least six seconds of uh, expiratory time for force water capacity to give us an, an adequate test. Okay, and I think that's it. So, questions for me about anything? Dr. Salzman, thanks for that uh, very informative presentation. Um, this is something we will see in clinic uh, throughout uh, training, so it's very helpful to, to understand where all this came from and how we can interpret the information here. Um, for us, we're, we're pretty much simple spirometry about our clinic sites, like many, and we yeah. do have ability for uh, plasmography over at our pulmonary clinic. So open the, for any questions now. There you are. Um, okay, it sounds like the, the crowd is, is uh, quiet, but we really do appreciate you um, presenting this one more time for us and hope we can en entice you back uh, a year from now to do it all over again. Sure, I'm happy to help in any way I can. Uh, so hopefully you'll get some practice doing this when you're in clinic and looking at spirometry, and certainly when you're with me, you'll you'll get plenty of practice uh, looking at PFT. So I uh, look forward to working to all of, with all of you guys. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you very much. This will conclude our presentations on conferences uh, online and allergy today. Um, you guys have a great week. Thank you.